Today, you have a lot of evangelical Christians in America that are very pro-Israel. Very. Christians are just really zealous in their uh, support of, of Israel. Now, has it always been that way throughout history? Or is oh, that God, a newer no. phenomenon? No, um, no it, it hasn't been that way through history. Traditionally, uh, Christianity was essentially anti-Semitic. The phenomenon of the Christian Zionists is relatively recent. They maintain that the Jews are God's chosen people and will always be God's chosen people. They use the term the apple of God's eye. And, and that's a more recent phenomenon? Yeah, I'd say a few hundred years, as far as I know. Mm -hmm. That does not go all the way back. Right. Replacement theology mm -hmm. has played a very important role in Christianity. But what is replacement theology? Replacement theology is the root and branch of Christian anti-Semitism. It's like a virus in the church. Basically is saying that the church now has superseded Israel and this theology that discards the place of the Jewish people and replaces it with the church, the new and true spiritual Israel, is very dangerous because I believe it's the primary root of anti-Semitism. Many theologians all through the centuries have preached replacement theology. Can you name some that, that have preached that? I have here everything about uh, John Chrysostom, and uh, the, 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 he is the chief anti-Semite of the church. The synagogue is worse than a whorehouse. It is the den of scoundrels and the repair of wild beasts. The temple of demons devoted to idolatrous cults the refuge of debauchees and the cavern of devils. It is a criminal assembly of Jews, a place of meeting for the assassins of Christ, a den of thieves, a dwelling of iniquity, the refuge of devils, a gulf and an abyss of perdition. I would say the same thing about their souls. They have demonized the Jews. This is still present in the mind of many. Throughout history, Christians have not looked at the Jews as God's chosen people. They looked at them as a people that rejected Christ and were therefore rejected by God. For example, the last book written by Martin Luther before he died was called The Jews and Their Lies. And in this book, he gives all kinds of scriptural arguments for why the Jews are not God's chosen people. And he also exposes a lot of the blasphemous teachings of the Talmud. His very last sermon, he preached about the Jews. And he said, the Jews hate our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And through their perfidious behavior, and he says that they, they create all kinds of stratagems and ruses to deceive us. And he got so angry at them, he actually said, we should go and burn all the copies of their Talmud. But he was inf infuriated about the Talmud. Of course, today, the Jews consider him a great anti-Semite. St. Augustine was no better. He was also anti-Semitic? That's mm. right. Okay. He was very demeaning. All this mm. is pure hatred. Mm -hmm. It doesn't matter whether you're listening to John Chrysostom, St. Augustine, Peter the Venerable, Martin Luther, John Calvin, you name the church father, you name the Protestant leader throughout history. They're all saying the same thing about the Jews, that they're the synagogue of Satan, that it's a false religion. This doctrine that the Jews are still God's chosen people is a new doctrine. You know, back before the late 1800s, everybody recognized what we're talking about now. Mm -hmm. But something began to change. First with Dr. Uh, you know, Cyrus Schofield. C.I. Schofield was a divorced man. He had trouble with alcohol. He was a lawyer turned preacher. He left his first wife, Leontine Sierre, in 1883. That's the year after he wrote his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. So in 1882, he writes his first book, Rightly Dividing the Word of Truth. 1883, he leaves his first wife, marries another lady, and then becomes a pastor in Texas. Very famous, very popular. Schofield's dispensational premillennial Bible was edited with financial assistance from prominent businessmen, some of which had questionable religious ties. And he had Jewish retainers who made him a member of a club called the Lotus Club, mm -hmm. a, a sort of a secret society 
and suddenly he had plenty of money. This corrupt lawyer who had abandoned his wife and was found guilty of numerous offenses as, as a corrupt attorney. But Schofield was given money and the Oxford group out of England published his Bible. Why would they take a crooked lawyer and make him the editor of a Bible? And then suddenly they had millions of dollars to promote it. With that amount of money, then the Bible took off. And it, it basically sealed the deal for the Jews. The Schofield Reference Bible is very pro-Israel, very Zionist. And this book, more than any other book, changed the thinking of an entire generation of young preacher boys. Another belief that Christians have today that is an incorrect belief that is not founded in Scripture is the belief that we should bless Israel. You know, they, they go back to the what they refer to as the Abrahamic covenant. They go back to Genesis chapter 12 and they say, oh, we got to bless Israel. If we want God's blessing, we have to bless them. Genesis 12 verses 1 through 3 is the key Scripture where God calls and blesses Abraham. It reads, now the Lord had said unto Abram, Get thee out of thy country, and from thy kindred, and from thy father's house, unto a land that I will show thee, and I will make of thee a great nation. And I will bless thee, and make thy name great, and thou shalt be a blessing. And I will bless them that bless thee, and curse him that curseth thee, and in thee shall all families of the earth be blessed. Now, according to this scripture, God is making a covenant with Abraham, and he tells Abraham, I will bless thee. The word thee is singular. He's speaking to Abraham. Well, in Schofield's notes on Genesis 12, he applies this blessing unto the future nation of Israel. That is not what the scripture teaches. And many evangelical Christians today do not get their doctrine on Israel from anything that's written in the New Testament. They're getting it from the notes of the Schofield Reference Bible. When you're reading these promises made to Abraham in the Old Testament, you have to realize what the Bible teaches in Galatians 3.16, when it says, now to Abraham and his seed were the promises made. Now, if we stop right there, you know, all the Christians of today or Zionists or whoever, they could say, see, it was to Abraham and his seed. But the verse goes on, it says, he saith not and to seeds, with an S at the end, making it plural. He says, he saith not and to seeds as of many, but as of one and to thy seed, which is Christ. So according to the Bible, the promises made to Abraham were made unto Abraham and unto Christ. And the Bible says in verse 29, and if ye be Christ's, then are you Abraham's seed and heirs according to the promise. According to the Bible, we as Christians, whether we be Jew or Gentile, are the heirs of the promises made to Abraham. Those today who are in the Middle East and the nation of Israel, they're not in Christ. 99% of them do not believe in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, they are not the seed of Abraham. Therefore, Genesis 12, 1 through 3 does not apply unto them. You know, people will say, well, we've got to support Israel if we want God's blessing on ourselves. If we want God's blessing on our church, if we want God's blessing on our nation, we must support a physical Israel. Well, if you just count back the last 66, 67 years of American history, do you find the blessing of God on our country? Did we have legalized abortion back in the 1940s? No, it's come since then. What was our debt? in the 1940s versus today. What were we like then compared to what we are now? You can't convince me that the blessings of God have fallen on this country because of a quote unquote promise to support a physical group of people somehow correlates to blessings from God. 